pretty good. There's only, wow, two, three new questions. The other ones are all questions. Well, thank you for being restrained with the questions. It's very kind of you all. Let's see what the questions were from yesterday. Can you please talk about the meditation process through feeling nimittas or just bliss? I'm not visual. Okay. You may not be that visual, but it's usually the case that the sense of sight is the dominant sense. That is why when you go uh, to the airport to get your aircraft back home, they will ask to see your visual appearance on the passport photo. They don't actually check what you sound like to go through the passport. They don't even actually take the photo of your feet. But I'm sure that everyone's toes are totally unique. They usually take the photo of your face. Why do they do that? Because in our society, the visual is the most dominant of the senses. And that is one of the reasons why when these nimittas come up, they are not visual objects. You're not seeing them with your eye, you're seeing them with your mind. <coughs> and it's because the usual, the strongest of the five senses is usually sight. It means that you usually interpret these mental objects as colors, as bright, beautiful colors. And one of the lovely things about the sight nimittas is a lot of it people experience those, so there's more information to know what they actually are and how they work. And one of those most important aspects of the visual nimittas, then again, they're not visual, they're seen with the mind, but they're interpreted as lights. And one of the most important parts of that is, I mentioned it before, if it's say it's a yellow, it's more yellow than yellow. The intensity of them and the the joy which is with them. However, there is possible to use other nimittas. However, they're much harder to work with. I have to admit to that. Sometimes people can have sound nimittas. And the sound nimittas are sometimes, you know, you're really peaceful, the five senses are disappearing, and you hear a sound and it's not uh, a, a real sound. No musical instruments or anything can actually create such beautiful um, sounds. It's more like heavenly music, some people say, or something which is out of this world. It has to be thrilling, peaceful, and beautiful. With sound, it's much harder to get the peace in it, the stillness. Lights, they can be still. What does it mean for sound being still? And the other nimittas, the actually feeling nimittas, uh, trying to interpret those as the feelings in your body, that kind of, I've never known anyone has been able to do that. It's usually just the sound nimittas or the, the feeling nimittas, or sound nimittas or the light nimittas. Those are the usual ones. But it's all the same, the same actual object you're seeing. I know that some people say, oh, you saw like a yellow nimitta, or a white nimitta, or a purple nimitta. You are seeing the same thing. It's just your interpretation, the labor you give to it. That's the only difference. And so, it doesn't really matter at all. I know there was one gentleman, and he was strange because when he was uh, getting some deep meditation, he experienced his mind as a black nimitta. And that kind of uh, shocked me. He said, black nimittas? Do such things exist? I've never seen a black nimitta. But then he started describing it to me. And he said, it's not just an ordinary black, it's the deepest, richest, sort of shimmering black you could ever imagine. More black than black more deep, and it's gorgeous. And all the way he described it, I say, fair enough, that's an imiter. 
So that's actually what these numbers are. The, you're seeing, you're experiencing your mind. It's the mind experiencing the mind. But how you use your language to actually to interpret it is mostly uh, interpreted as some visual object. I hope that's uh, clear enough to you. But a lot of times it doesn't really matter because these things, they just occur. So, wow, what was that? And then they're so peaceful, they're so beautiful. The five senses are either totally gone or they're almost gone. Like I was saying this morning with the walking meditation, it's like you hear sounds, but it's like a million miles away or a hundred meters away, but it's right happening in right in your ear. If time permits, I've started something now. A ghost story, please. <laughs> well, what I'll do, I'll leave that, and if we do have time, and you really want to, we'll turn the lights down again. <laughs> Dear Ajahn Brahm, is it possible to open the shutters and windows in the meditation hall to let in the beautiful, pure, fresh air and light that the mountain forest to offer us? I something the hall. I leave the hall. I love the hall, but would like to also meditate in the air and the light. Thank you. One thing is when you meditate, uh, in this tradition, we close our eyes. So whether the shutters are opened or closed, you will not see anything. And that's important. The reason why we close the shutters or we close our eyes or we use, I've still got a few of these left, you know, these iPads or eye shades, the reason that we do that is we calm the senses down. Now, when we're actually in the hall meditating, we're not here to uh, enliven the senses, but to calm them down. Of course, you know, if it's the light, you know, I much prefer it, you know, to have the shutters in here. If you want to meditate in the light, you can go outside. But to get really deep meditation, it's best to have it nice and dark. When I designed this hall, I did ask the architect, can we have no windows at all? Now, many um, halls, like, you know, they're cinemas, or they are, um, when they have uh, shows or plays or uh, concerts, you know, we don't have windows. And the reason is because if you have windows, you tend to want to look out. When there's no windows, you have to look in. And so that's one of the reasons why we have these shutters here. We do have this, sh no, that, we did, um, the architect said you have to have these and I was arguing with him so many times, I thought, okay, but I can put these shutters on them on those three sides. And the back shutters, the reason we don't have the shutters on the back side over there is because the sun never actually shines from that angle. So if ever we're doing any presentation, PowerPoints or a screen, we can put the screen on here and it doesn't really bother uh, when the sun shines through the windows in the morning and the evening. So, and anyway, the, all we can do is actually raise the shutters, but still there's windows in there which are fixed windows, so you can't actually open the windows. So if you want the nice fresh air, again, there's lots of it outside. For walking meditation, would one walk at normal speed and gait? If you want to, you could. So sometimes people do walk even fast. In some of the forest tradition, they walk really fast. And I've walked fast. If I've you know, ate, eaten too much or got a tummy ache, it's a wonderful way to digest food when you just a bit of exercise. But if you want to get still and peaceful, you walk slowly. You don't because you don't force yourself, it just becomes natural to walk slowly. It feels better. Or would, one, or would one slow down consciously in order to observe the walk better? It's more like you slow down consciously, but you just like slowing down, so that's what you do. People do things way too fast in life. Why not just learn how to walk slowly? 
The problem is, though, that once, this was the monastery in England when it first opened, that one of their uh, followers, she was a clinical psychiatrist, and she lived in a village in Sussex, and of course, in these villages, everybody knows one another. And she actually bought this big house. And it was so big, it did have a, I think it probably was stables or garage, I'm not sure what. She renovated it, and that became a lovely place for a meditation hall. And so they held their first retreats there, just no small retreats, maybe 20, 30 people. That's all they could accommodate. It was only for a weekend. But then what happened was they started to do their walking meditation in the garden outside. It was nice weather and had like a nice uh, expanse of grass. So they started doing their walking meditation outside. And you know what it's like in English villages? People open their curtains and say, what's going on there? And they saw all these people, a lot of them were dressed in white, <laughs> walking really slowly. And they'd never seen anything like that before in their lives. So one of them rang up the police and complained, that psychiatrist, she's brought her patients home for the weekend. <laughs> it's a true story. And the police arrived to take all these meditators you know, to the, the um, mental hospital said, you're not allowed to escape. Said, we're not escaping, we're just like you. We just, we're going on a meditation retreat. And the story from here is that we did have one of these uh, retreats which did that slow walking. And at the same time, because you know, I wasn't involved in it, I was over the road in Bodhinyana Monastery, and some, a Sri Lankan family, they asked, look, you know, you know, we're good Buddhists, no, we won't make any noise. Can we just have a, a look? We won't go in any of the rooms or the halls. We'll just have a look. I said, okay, but be very quiet. Don't disturb anybody. And so they came over here, and then half an hour later, they came back to Bodhinyana Monastery. I was still receiving guests up in the dining room, and their kid, he's about six or seven years of age, he came up to me, Achan Bram, Achan Bram, Achan Bram. He was really excited. You've got to do something. Do what? He said, your retreat center has been invaded by zombies. Because <laughs> apparently that's what zombies do. They walk really slowly. <laughs> and he saw all these meditators doing this slow walking meditation. And he thought that was zombies. So to this day, if you do the slow walking meditation outside, it's called zombie meditation. I don't know, I've never seen zombie films. But apparently, is that true? The zombies walk slowly? Yeah, okay, yeah. I've seen that in there. <laughs> okay. So, sometimes have some interesting times in this monastery. How do we understand wisdom? And what can is it? What? Candors is it part of wisdom? Wisdom, not a thing, but an adjective. A deluded way of consciousness interprets other candors. So the jhana realm begins. Jhana realm beings have no delusion and are all destined for nibbana. I th well, to answer most of that question, which you know probably I don't understand it because of the English is a bit strange. But when a person gets into these deep meditations, it's not only blissful, it's not only really, really good fun and very still and gives you more data for your wisdom to work on. Now I'm saying that as a scientist. You do your experiments, you have some really strange experiments and the data is quite unique and from that you can get conclusions about the nature of the universe and the world. But uh, in those jhanas, it's not just the extra data. When you emerge from those jhanas, you know, the five hindrances disappear. You know, the wanting, the ill will, 
sloth and torpor, you don't have any dullness of the mind. The mind is so bright, the restlessness and remorse, the mind is, can be fixed, it can take a subject. This is like insight. I'm using a big object. What is this? Come on, you've got to speak. What is it? Is, is that the right answer? That's only part of it. What is it? Yeah, well, come on, say some more. What else? Look, there's no right answer. That's our problem. When you ask a question, you think, oh, you get a, a smart answer and that's right. Oh, well done. No. You've seen me do this before. It's not just a back scratcher. This is a very nice back scratcher. <laughs> but it's also, you can bang people on the head with it. <laughs> but it's not a head banger. It's so many things it can be. The longer you look, the more you see. And that's actually what happens with insight. Sometimes you see something, oh, that's the jitter. You're not looking long enough. You see something, oh, that's a nimitta. You just keep on looking. Stop giving things names. The longer you see, the longer you look, the more you see. You tend to explore it, go deeper into it. And that's what insight is like. You've got to be still to be able to look long enough to penetrate and see some of the things of this, which I'm holding up, which you've never seen before. And that's fascinating. That's where you get new understandings. You see it for yourself. You have to stay long there. And soon, you know, you can understand it much more deeply. When we're restless, the mind doesn't stay long enough at all. On this one, something else. Stick. Uh, I don't know what this is. Uh, gong or whatever. Cup. Sometimes that's the way we, we work. We're so fast, we can never stay with anything long enough to really see it. So you stay here for long periods of time. You just look at this for an hour. You can explore right into it. Remember what we said, see a world in a grain of sand heaven and a wildflower, hold infinity in the palm of your hand and eternity in an hour. That's speeding up the insight practice. See a world in a grain of sand, it takes a long time to be able to see a whole world. So you hold that grain of sand in front of your conscious sight awareness for a long period. You can see so more into it. I did allude to that when I told the story of the most beautiful clump of bamboo in the world, I was just sitting watching it for a whole 50 minutes and hadn't finished with it. I had to go back the next day, six, no, sorry, eight days in a row. And just, only the night, no, it wasn't in a row, it was about five or six days, and then I decided one day I should really go for some exercise instead of just walking a little way, seeing this gorgeous clump of bamboo and sitting down and not having e any exercise at all. So one day I did actually some exercise, but eight of those nine days, I just, you know, for what would have been a total of 400 minutes, eight times 50, just stare at a clump of bamboo and I hadn't finished with it. And that's actually what happens when you have some stillness, when the mind isn't restless. You can stay with something, and you really get to know it. So that's actually where wisdom comes from. And the last thing, the special type of uh, wisdom, is when there's no doubt there. And it takes a long time to understand the nature of what doubt is. And it's only like many of these things, and I'll say this similarly again later on, it's only when things disappear, that you can know what they are. When water disappears, then you can, the fish can understand what water was. When you're in the water, lived in the water, born in the water, all your life in the water, how can you know what water is? 
But when the, fi the, wa the water disappears, ah, oh, that's what water is. Do you know what air is? We live in air, we breathe air. But sometimes you go to places like Tiger's Nest in Bhutan, and the air is so thin there, there's hardly much air there, so it's very hard to breathe. You get a little bit of understanding what air is. When it disappears and vanishes, that's when you can know it. So what wisdom is, to seeing what a thing is, is, a lot of time it has to vanish, first of all. When it does, you know, this is not a theory, it's not inference, it's real bare experience. And that's actually where you start to know what these things like candles are. These are the five candles. I call them components of existence. You know, the candles is the Pali word. And what translations do you know the candles as? I prefer components of existence because that describes you know, what they, they really are. You know, the first of those candles is stuff. It's not just body, it's like wood, it's like metal, it's like air, it's like space. I love the idea, it's, okay, I'm in the mood now, <laughs> sorry. Even when I was a kid going on a bus to school, you know, as a 14, 15, 16 year old, sometimes you'd imagine, you know, what is at the end of the universe? If you can go fast enough, what would the end of the universe look like? You know, would there be these big signs like they have in Singapore where somebody looked like being shot, don't go any further? Or would it be a big brick wall or razor wire? Or how can you have an end of the universe? It has to be something on the other side. And then it's only later on you started to understand this universe is only a certain volume. This universe has a limited volume. And that's, I'll tell you what, I, what was it? I, I think it was about 36,000 million uh, light years radius, a sphere of that size. That's the volume of this universe. I may have the figures a little bit wrong, but it has a limited volume, the universe in which we live. <coughs> but it's got no edges. It doesn't have an end, but it's limited. And first of all, that seems, that makes no sense. If it's only a limited volume, why doesn't it have any walls or edges or something? And of course the answer is just given by looking at this planet Earth. Planet Earth has a limited area, space. We don't have, you know, often we're running out of good space to build houses or cities in. It's limited area, but it's got no edges to it. It's like a sphere. A sphere has limited surface area, but no edges. And now you know what space is. Limited volume, but no edges. It's curved. It's harder for us to imagine that because we are basically two-dimensional beings. You can understand two dimensions. Three dimensions is much more difficult. And when you have like three dimensions curved in the fourth dimension, that's almost impossible for us to visualize, but we know that's what it is. And then, so that's candors. But then, we have space, what about time? That's important in spirituality. So many spiritual religious traditions, they really worry about the beginning of time and the end of time. And that's, you know, where we have gods and creators and all sorts of stuff. Does Buddhism have anything like that? No. Because even time is limited. 
but it has no beginning or end, no edges, like planet Earth, limited area, but no beginnings, no ends. Have I confused you? Yes. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> but it shows you where we're, where we're going. You know, the reason why we think, you know, this world, this universe is infinite when it's not is because of our conceptual framework has not been um, allowed to interpret the world properly. Of course, now we know the, the planet Earth is not flat, it's round. The universe is round. Time is round. Which means you don't need any beginnings or ends. That's, to me, that's really cool. That's kind of beautiful. Anyway, I'm sure I've bamboozled you all now. So that's kind of wisdom. Uh, and you know, what is consciousness? In Buddhism, we have the uh, fifth kanda called vinyana. That does not mean consciousness. That's not a good translation. A much better translation is consciousnesses. There's six different types of consciousness. And those consciousnesses, when you say consciousnesses, it takes away from this illusion of like consciousness being this really weird, um, powerful, incredibly everywhere type of essential, spiritual, human being, other beings, essence. When it's consciousnesses, and each one is different, then it actually gives a much better uh, indication of what this knowing is. Sometimes it's hard to find similes for the, these things. So years ago, I developed this, um, what was it, uh, fruit, not fruit salad. Well, it's salad, no. The, yeah, fruit salad simile. So imagine a plate, that's you know, your, your reality. And sometimes on that plate there's a coconut. And the coconut vanishes, and then there's a banana. And the banana vanishes, there's another coconut, and then that vanishes, and there's an apple. And the apple vanishes, and there's a, another coconut, then there's another apple. This is like the fruit salad simile, where the coconut represents your mind, the sixth sense. Apple represents your eye, first, you know, the, the sense of seeing, the apple of the eye. Banana represents smelling, your nose. I usually have cauliflower represents your ear. I'm just making this up, just, but it's a different, the ear appears and then vanishes. And then you have the coconut, the knowing. You know that you heard something. And sometimes it's coconut, and then another coconut. You had a, a, a conscious experience of the mind, and then you know you knew the mind. And all these different aspects of consciousness, six totally different consciousnesses, they come and go. Nothing stays. And that's your consciousness is nothing there all the time. How do you know that? The only way you know that, when all those other five consciousnesses disappear, you know, the, the apple, the eye, the ear, the nose, the tongue, the taste, and the feeling, when all those disappear, all you're left with is that sixth consciousness, the mind. You know what that is. When you're in those jhanas, those are the only places, well, maybe the nimittas, where you can have a direct experience of what this mind really is. You're experiencing it. 
the mind without the other five senses. As the Buddha said, if you want to know what gold is, you've got to refine the gold and get rid of all the other trace elements like tin or zinc or silver or iron or something. When it's just gold, 100% nothing else, they can understand what it is. When it's mind, just mind, nothing else but mind, no other five senses, and it's there for a long time, just the mind, then you can understand what it is. That's one of the reasons why you do need these deep meditations. You've got personal experience there for long periods of time, and their five hindrances you know, are gone, so you can actually look at that, and the mind doesn't sort of uh, move from it. And that's actually how you understand candors. So the jhana realm beings have no delusion and are all destined for nibbana. No. Because the jhana realm beings, in the jhana you are perfectly still. You're just seeing one thing. And you're with that one thing. But wisdom cannot appear in the jhana. Wisdom appears after the jhana. When in the jhana you're just way too still and you've only got just one experience. Uh, when I was a kid, I still remember this TV show, it was a quiz show. And at the end of the show, they take a photograph of something and ask the audience, you know, what is this? And I remember once there was this photograph, it was a little black dot and a little bit of uh, brown, uh, like in a, there's an octagon around it, and then a very slight red line all around the octagon. And they asked, what is it? It's a usual object. And of course it was a sharpened pencil photographed, you know, edge on. And it's so impossible to know that, because to know something, understand it, you look at it this way and that way and this way and that way, you need perspectives for you to understand what a thing is. And I thought that's a great simile for the jhana experience, because in the jhana, you can't have perspectives. Everything is so still and fixed. It's only when the jhana is finished, that's when you have the power and the new experience to understand what that was. So within the jhana realms, you're stuck there. However, am I just going too deep for you? I haven't told any jokes, have I yet? Okay, well, I'll carry on anyway until I... There, well, there is this beautiful term called the jhananagami, the non-returner. If you have some basic understanding, the right view enough to be a soul one or a stream winner, and then you get into a jhana, and you pass away there. You know, it takes a while to pass away within a jhana. You're pretty safe in many ways. But then, if you pass away, you're, an, what, uh, you're a stream winner, and then you pass away in a jhana, then you go into these jhana realms. You have a wonderful time blissing out for eons, but very still experience. Doesn't change for a few eons. And then, once that, when the, once that passes away, then you're fully enlightened and disappear. Your last birth in the jhana realms. Does that make sense? Am I going too deep for you? Anyway, that's actually the question, the wisdom of these incredible, powerful realms of existence. Anyway, Chanda Samadhis, sustained effort and goals, theory and energy. Please explain how to practice. So Chanda is, it really actually means like consent, approval. It's not so much actually doing something, it's like approving it. That's why we use that word, you know, in our, uh, group management of the Sangha. If there's a meeting and you can't come for some reason, you give, you know, what we call, we give our chanda, 
approval to proceed in absence. So it is actually what directs you. So the chanda, you know, you want to let go. You have the chanda to let go. The virya, the energy. Virya is, uh, it is an interesting Pali word because the first part of that is vira. And I know the vira is from things like Mahavira. Vira is supposed to be an effort of letting go. They describe you know, the great effort of the king's elephant in a battle. He's willing to let go of their life, even getting wounded. It's not just energy to attain things. It's the energy, like the striving to let go, for, for want of a better word. So this is not, I've only got four days to go. I'm going to go for it. I'm going to not sleep. I'm going to meditate. I don't care what happens to me. I'm going to sit in this seat, even though my blood dries up and my bones turn to dust, I'm not going to move. Enlightenment or bust. People do that. I remember doing that. My first year as a Buddhist, and I went to this Waysack ceremony in Cambridge, and it was Dr. Sadatista. The great monk, many of you may have heard of him. And, you know, he gave this uh, sermon about the Buddha sitting down and saying, I'm not going to move. Even though my blood dries up, my bones turn to dust, I'm not going to move from this seat until I get full enlightenment. And he was a Buddha, okay, so he could do stuff like that. But then I thought, as an arrogant 18-year-old student, I said, I've got all this education. The Buddha never had that. If he can do it, I'm going to do it. Anyway, I'm a very busy young man. I've got many things I need to do in my life. Let's get enlightenment out of the way quickly. <laughs> and then I can do all these other stuff. So I, after the, the way sack day in the evening, I put my uh, cushion down. And honestly, this is a pretty accurate... Uh, rec uh, recollection of what happened. Usually I would meditate for 25 minutes. That was my max. On a good meditation, maybe half an hour. And I said, no, I'm not going to move. <laughs> and I actually made 40 minutes. It's amazing, 40 minutes. I was in agony. My, my knees were burning, my back was aching, my bottom was sore, and I couldn't take it any longer. So I opened my eyes after 40 minutes, and I certainly was not enlightened. And I looked at my bones, and they were still intact. The blood was still going around my body. <laughs> and that was the most I could do. And that was just a young, arrogant young man. And I know of another monk, he's still a monk, good on him. He was a good, fr a good friend years ago. He decided to meditate all night without moving. So he got in a nice meditation position. You know, he got cushions under his legs, under his bottom, made himself as comfortable as possible. And once he got himself as comfortable as possible, right, this is it. I'm not going to move until the dawn comes up. And he didn't move until the dawn came up. And we had to take him to the hospital for double knee reconstruction, honestly. <laughs> please, please, you admire his endurance. We you know sometimes there's a bit of a lack of wisdom there. So please, don't do the enlightenment or bust trick. You will bust. <laughs> and we will have to be the ones who take you to hospital. So anyway, I think enough about that. You have some great questions, thank you. Please tell the story about the cat that adopted and ran away to Dhammaloka to see you. Oh my goodness. <laughs> okay. I think if you want to read that, that a venerable Karunika, uh, she wrote a little story based on that episode. 
and uh, in her magazine. I think we have a link to that in our BSWA newsletter. And she wrote it from the cat's perspective. And it's a very charming story. But anyway, the real story was, yes, we had a couple of cats when we started Bodhinyana Monastery. One of them was called Kit Cat, a very original name, but it doesn't matter about the name, we love that cat. It was born in a log, you know, a feral cat. And it adopted us, we adopted it. It was a beautiful cat. The only time it left the monastery was to go to the vet in Byford, that's, you know, what, 20 kilometers north of here, you know, to get what we call monasticized. <laughs> so it wouldn't have any kittens. <laughs> that's the only time it left. It, you know, it was part of our family here. And uh, eventually people said, look, it's catching too many uh, other birds and some of the other feral animals in the in the forest in the evenings. Having a cat is not correct in a in a bush in Australia. So, you know, some people said you have to put a bell around its neck. We did, but all that did it made it more mindful, so it could creep up on the birds. <laughs> you know, without sort of ringing the bell at all. And I said, well, you know, we can try another bell. You know, the main big bell we have outside the hall, which weighs a couple of tons. <laughs> you, can't, you can't put that around the, the cat's neck. So the only choice was we had to find a home for that cat. So we found a nice home in a suburb of Waterman's, north of the river in Perth, and maybe, about, I think it's about 12 kilometers from Nolamara Temple. 12 kilometers northwest of, uh, Bodhi, of uh, Dhammaloka Temple. That cat had never been into the city or into the Perth metropolitan area suburbs at all in its life. You knew that. So, anyway, I always felt bad about this because basically I loved that cat. It was kind of my cat. I know Amanda said sometimes it's his cat, but in those early days I really looked after it. And I, and I used its trust in me to bring it over close to me and put it in this, ba in this bag and put it in the person's car in the place where your feet go in the back seat. Couldn't see out any windows. And you know, said goodbye to it. I know it would be looked after, but nevertheless you feel like you're, you're neglecting the trust which that cat had put into you. But anyway, so we got taken up into the house, which was not far from the beach, in a suburb of Waterman's. And she kept it in that house for about three or four days. And after three or four days inside the house, she you know, let it play in the garden. But instead of playing in the garden, the cat ran for the, the front gate in the garden and went through the, you know, the, the the, the holes in the metal gate. And so the lady who was looking after the cat, Chris, you know, she ran down the road looking for it, couldn't find it, got in the car and went driving around looking for this cat. And she couldn't find it. She was looking for about an hour and a half, two hours. And I just happened to be, it was a Saturday or a Sunday, I forget which, I was just giving the talks in our Nolamara city center that weekend. And when she called me, she said, Ajahn Brahm, I'm really, you know, very sad to say this, you know, your cat has run away. I don't know where it is, maybe if you're lucky it will run all the way from you know, Waterman's to uh, Serpentine, to the monastery. That's about 80 kilometers. And I replied to her and said, you don't have to worry. It's with me, not right now. I was walking past the front door and I heard this meow, meow. And I opened the door and it was Kit Kat. I kind of couldn't believe it. It had never been in Perth, in the, no, not just the city of Perth, into with all its suburbs, in its life. That I know. And it went about 12 kilometers, it was across a freeway, and I don't know, the bridge or whatever, and it found me in two hours. 
And you know, I do have a shower every day. I do wash my robes. How on earth could it know where I was? You know, it didn't have a mobile phone. It couldn't ask the RAC. How, did, how could it find you? To this day, I don't know how it did that. But nevertheless, it did. And after that, of course, the poor little Kit Kat was allowed to come and stay here for the rest of its life. And it's actually buried. Uh, it was cremated. We cremated it. And did we cremate it? I think we did. But anyway, it was ashes was buried under the Bodhi tree behind the main hall. Little Kit Kat. Ran away to Dhammaloka to see you after it was put in a like a hobe to save it from eating birds. Anyway, how to forgive and let go of the past, of our own mistakes and people we hurt. If you can let go, or if you don't let go, if you are a prisoner of the past, there's no freedom there at all. And there's one person who, oh, this is wonderful stories of forgiveness. The one which somebody showed me recently was of this lady. She was a twin and she was in Auschwitz. And her and her sister, instead of being sent straight to the gas chambers, was taken aside to be experimented on by Dr. Mengele. And she said, you know, her and her sister, it was incredible painful what they did to them. And her sister uh, died. She somehow survived. And after that Second World War, you know, she had so much hatred and ill will and wanting revenge for these incredibly sadistic you know, German doctors who was responsible you know, for killing her sister, her twin sister, and for causing so much pain and suffering to her. And then when she was old, you know, just by chance, I think in South America somewhere, she spotted one of the doctor's assistants still alive. And so she traced him for his address and wrote him this letter saying, I know who you are. This was my, my name. You experimented on me and my twin sister. Please meet me in Auschwitz. Challenged him to come to Auschwitz. And kind of he had no choice. He said afterwards, he wrote afterwards, you know, this was causing him so much pain himself knowing what he'd done. And so they met in Auschwitz in the camp. And this was, you know, many years later, it all closed down. It was a, a uh, it's very hard to say, tourist attraction, but a place anyone can go to recollect on what happened there. And so she met him there. And when they met together in Auschwitz, she forgave him. She said, look, you know, we've been holding this for way too long. And afterwards she wrote about what it felt like you know, to forgive this man who for many years you know, was a monster in her nightmares. And she gave this wonderful piece of advice. Once you forgive, you're not a victim anymore. You're a victor. So you have a choice there, to be the victim or the victor. It's obviously when you're the victor, it's so much more powerful. You can forgive anything, honestly. You have these great examples of people who have done that. And you think, well, if that can be forgiven, I don't know what you're worried about, what you've done wrong, your mistakes and people you've hurt. You can become a victim and become free. Dear Ajahn, it seems like life was difficult in Tana where you were a young monk. Would you say that it is beneficial to be uncomfortable for one's practice to really develop? I don't know if it was beneficial. Physically it was difficult, but it had so many advantages. 
you know, I was saying already about when you went on this walk about, you know, the Tudong, the Charaka, they say in Sri Lanka, and it was the most beautiful time of your life. No responsibilities at all. It was simple, physically hard, but I was adventurous enough. Like some people go camping, and that's even tougher probably. You know, I always knew I had food and I was comfortable and I had lots of, I could speak Thai and Lao perfectly then. And so it wasn't that difficult. It was actually kind of adventurous. And also you could meet all these amazing monks and teach you meditation, do really strange things. And you can find these wonderful caves in the mountains. Now those places you would go to for solitude, now they're mostly resorts for tourists in Thailand. In those days, there's great places you can go to meditate. Physically difficult, but emotionally inspiring. How did the Buddha advise to spend time while on retreat? All day anapana or add other practices? You know, in those days, did the Buddha do retreats? Yes. Sometimes even the Buddha said, he said, I'm just going into solitude. The only person I want to see is the person who brings me my food. Why did the Buddha do that? You know, was it because he wasn't enlightened yet? Or was it because he wanted to set a tradition? of going, you know, even the Buddha, going into some solitude, beautiful places where you can meditate and be still, and you know, just one person can bring you your food, and that's it. You don't need much to live. And so that's actually what the Buddha did. But when you are on retreat, if you're a Buddha, you don't just sit for half an hour. You sit there for a couple of hours, three hours, four hours, when you sit for long periods of time, the day goes past really quickly. And sometimes you see this in the uh, Theragata and Terigata, that some of those monks, you know, after they've been meditating, they go for walks in the, in the jungle, or in the mountains. And they'd write all these incredible poems about how wonderful it was to see all these animals and you were friends with them and how beautiful that solitude was. And I often wondered, why did all these great monks and nuns start to you know, write poems about nature? They were obviously enjoying the beauty of nature so much. And one of the things I decided, it wasn't explained to me, that nature is something you cannot control. You can't own. So you can enjoy it and it's safe to enjoy. You can't get attached to it. You can't own it. How can I focus on stillness when my mind is continually distracted with too many thought with with hundred thoughts? How do I slow down and tell my mind to shut up? Okay, I haven't told this story yet, and this again is a powerful story. This was powerful for me. My sixth range retreat, I spent in the north of Thailand in this gorgeous monastery. For me, it was like paradise. It was in the middle of a tea plantation. <laughs> and I was English. I could have as much tea as I wanted. And one of the other things they gave there, the first time, this was in nine, six years, 1980, I think, or 79, 80. They also had kombucha. They had so much tea there, they made this sweet tea and they put this, uh, like, more like a mushroom inside of it, you know, the fungus, and that's where they had kombucha. I had some of that every afternoon, a whole bottle of it. It was just gorgeous. I was healthy and having a wonderful time. And I was the only monk in that monastery. And when I asked the villagers, how come there's not more monks here? And they said, well, some monks come, but it's too quiet for them. What? Too quiet? <laughs> They're crazy. It was so peaceful in that place. There was a traffic problem. 
the traffic problem was once a week a truck would come to take things down the hill and bring things up. And you have to be looking in the right direction to notice it. And that's all the traffic there ever was. It was idyllic. And they had this wonderful cave. A huge cave. I used to spend during the hot season, just had my one meal of the day, washed up, and then went in the cave until the late afternoon. And at the front of that cave, there was this papaya tree. And that was the most delicious papaya I've ever eaten in my life, from that day to this day. And that's where I got the story from. Why was that delicious? Because all the bats in the cave would poo on that papaya tree as they went out of the cave, would poo on that papaya tree as they went back in the cave. You've all heard me say, if something bad happens to you in your life, it's like, you know, treading in the dog shit. You don't wipe it off your shoes, you take it home and wipe it off under the apple tree or the mango tree or the durian tree, whatever else you like, and your durians will be more delicious than ever. Why? Because of the dog shit. And that's what was happening with that, that's where that simile came from. Those papayas, oh, they were just so sweet and so juicy. And so I was having a wonderful time there. But you know what happened after about four or five weeks? And I had lots of free time, I was meditating, and my meditation started to get really bothered with restlessness. But not ordinary restlessness. All the thoughts which started invading my mind were old memories of old girlfriends. At that time, it was my sixth range retreat. I was 29 years of age, you know, still handsome. <laughs> <laughs> and I started thinking, I wonder if she's still available. I said, look, I, I don't want to fantasize. I want to be a monk. I want to watch my breath. But you know, whatever I did, I couldn't stay with my breathing. My mind went all over the place. And as the days went past, it got even more weird you know, weird fantasies and just, you know, weird ideas, all sensual and sexual. And so I was getting so crazy, I was by myself. I went to the big Buddha statue in the hall, <coughs> bowed three times, and then I asked, help, give me some insight. I was going crazy. And the insight came, do a deal. I was a Westerner. So what we do, deals. And the, de <laughs> and the deal was, okay, mind, most of the day you watch your breath. But if you really want to you know, think sexual fantasies, weird stuff, okay, I will let you from 3 p.m. to 4 p.m. every afternoon. And I won't stop you at all. If you want to think like that, great but for one hour a day, the rest of the day you behave. That sounded fair to me. But then what happened? Still really you know, difficult keeping all those stupid thoughts out. And when it came to three o'clock, I was exhausted. I went to my hut, leant against the wall, put my feet out. Okay, mind, and now I'm not gonna stop you at all. The weirdest, most embarrassing thoughts, the worst unmonkish thoughts you can, you can think, you're allowed. And that's when I watched every breath without missing one, without any effort at all. Honestly, that changed, that gave me so much insight on how the mind works. When you try and control the mind, it will throw a tantrum. It will win. It's stronger than you. The mind is the forerunner of all things. It's the strongest. But when you don't use force, you use kindness. Okay, mind. If that's what you want to think, fine by me. And it realizes you're its friend. It doesn't want to think stupid thoughts. And it stayed with the breath so easily, effortlessly without any problem at all. 
if you're thinking any thoughts, not just sexual thoughts, allow it. See what happens. You'll find how easy meditation is when you make friends with your mind. That's a true story. It changed a lot of what I understood about meditation. Reflecting on anatta, non-self, seems to help with letting go in meditation and bringing up compassion when faced with problems. But can this go in a bad direction, giving anatta can only be seen after jhanas? In general, would it be putting the cart before the horse to contemplate results of the path as part of the practice? It can do, but there's some parts of anatta which is very easy to, to practice and is very helpful. Now the idea of a self, you know, who do you take yourself to be? But no, let's do one of the other aspects of anatta. Not me, not mine, not a self. That middle one, not mine. What do you own? Why do people keep saying, my meditation, my problem, my experience? Stop owning such things. We got into the habit of that. You know, my family, my body. This is not my body. It's just the body I happen to be in right now. I know many people are saying, Ajahn Brahm, look, you are getting fat for health reasons. You know, can't you actually get thinner? And I said, no, it's not my body. I don't own it. I don't have no control over it. This is now heritage listed. <laughs> so I can change what's inside, but on the outside it must stay looking the same. I'm just having fun with you. But, but anyhow, the fact that you, know, you don't own things. What a wonderful thing that is. This is not my meditation retreat centre. You just build it, teach it. I don't own it. I give all that responsibility to, um, right now, to Robin. She's a manager. <laughs> if you like something I say, you can come and praise me. Any complaints? Robin. <laughs> okay, yes. <laughs> the waste bin. Anyway, so that's a nice thing. How little you own. So don't own anything. Do you own your past? Why do you call it my past then? You don't own it. It's just like a memory. If you own it, you have responsibilities. Do you own your future? No. How free can you be when you don't own things? Anyway, I listened to your talk, How to Be a Happy Little Hermit. Did I give a talk like that? I give so many talks, some weird talks, like Buddhism and bananas. That's one of my favourite talks, I really like that talk, Buddhism and Bananas. And it started off, when you have a banana, how do you eat the banana? Most people, when they peel the banana, they peel it from the stalk. That's going to be quite thick and that's how they peel it. I just watch people at breakfast, that's how they peel bananas. That's wrong. Who are the experts on bananas? Monkeys, how do they peel bananas? It's from the other end where the flower was. So follow the experts. How many people go to these lay meditation teachers? Who are the experts on meditation? The monks and nuns. Don't say monkeys. <laughs> So that's one of my questions on bananas. And how, <coughs> in the old days, how did they catch monkeys? You know, this, they were very smart, these farmers. They would just get a, a like a, a, a coconut, they put a small hole in the, in the top of it. You know, they'd get the drink, the drink out, the, the liquid, and maybe some of the, the white flesh of the of the uh, coconut, 
and they get a strong piece of string, they tie it to a tree and put a banana in it. And they leave it there overnight. They just go and take a rest, get some dinner. And in the morning, it always happened, a monkey would find that banana. They'd you know, put their hand inside the coconut and their fist was big enough to fit into the coconut. When their fist was holding a banana, it was too big. They couldn't get the banana and the fist out. And that's how they would catch the, the monkeys. When the farmer came, and just not rushing, just ambling towards that coconut, the monkey would see the farmer and start to panic and really try to pull that banana out. And he would never let it go. All the monkey needed to do was to let go of the banana and get his hand out easy. Could the monkey let go? Why can't you let go of things? Because it's my banana. I found it. I own it. It's mine. <laughs> that mine got monkeys caught so often. And it gets you caught too. Let go. It's not mine. Let it go. Make sense? So I gave a whole talk about bananas for you know, 45 minutes. <laughs> and it makes it more interesting. I gave the talk on Buddhism and coffins. <laughs> that was very popular. You heard one of the main stories in that last night. <laughs> anyway, I did talk how to be a happy little hermit from 14 years ago. I thought this would be insightful for you to share given the importance of loving yourself with regards to our meditation practice. I don't know what I said there, but uh, happy to be a hermit is when you don't own anything, how can you ever fail? It's not yours. You, it's nice being a monk, even though I worked so hard, and many other monks worked hard building this place, we don't own Sojana Grove. We don't own Bodhinyana Monastery. So if a big bushfire comes and it all burns down, will you be upset? No, oh, well, I, I just build it, that's all, I don't own it. Isn't that more easy to be able to let things go? If you can, save it, fine. If you don't, fine. Anyway, uh, happy little hermit. Uh, I forget what I said there. Are loving yourself with regards to our meditation practice. What is loving yourself? Loving yourself is not like liking yourself. Loving yourself is telling yourself, the door of my heart is open to me, no matter what I ever do. The unconditional part of love. You know, the opening of the door of your heart always comes with that no matter what you ever do, or how you ever turn out, whatever happens. The unconditional love makes the love not attachment, but letting go. It's a freeing. You don't have to be perfect. How many of you are perfect? Be honest. Aren't you perfect? And you're running a monastery down in Albany? I know who's perfect. You put his hand up, please. Tell you where. Yay! <laughs> so anyway, that's how it works. I'm a single mole, so I need all the help I can get. Oh, sorry, single male. <laughs> Did that on purpose. Dear Ajahn Mahal, I'm a single male, so I need all the help I can get. Can you please share some insight into Buddha's teachings, how to handle a coexistence between a man, woman, or any romantic relationships with Metta? I haven't got so much time yet, so forget it. <laughs> <laughs> no. You know, I sometimes wondered why it is that people just want a spiritual blessing when they get married. And I get so many invitations, I'm happy to accept them. 
know, to do wedding blessings. Why do you invite me? I've never been married. <laughs> what would I know? <laughs> and the, but then, you know, after so many years doing thousands, not thousands, hundreds of wedding blessings, sometimes you understand that the part of you know, coexisting with you know, another partner, it doesn't have to be um, different genders, even same-sex relationships, there's a huge amount of letting go in a relationship. And that bit of letting go, letting your sense of self go, and you all know that story, in a relationship you never think of yourself, you never think of your partner, you think of us. You know, you sacrifice your wants, your needs, for us. And eventually, you know, if you do have kids, then there's a huge amount of letting go happens. And that letting go gives a spiritual edge to a relationship. That's one of the reasons why there's a religious or spiritual component to that, which monks can really help. Next question, I'm going really fast now. How do deep meditations benefit daily life? Number one, it gets you out of daily life. There's, there's too many people on the planet, too many consumers. And if you get all your pleasure out of deep meditation, you don't need TVs, you don't need internet, you don't need big houses, and so you consume much less. Isn't that great for the internet, for the, the environment? You don't need a car. I don't own a car. Monastery does. <laughs> <laughs> Same thing. Right. But what it does mean is, in daily life, it's it possible to get angry. And that's a beautiful thing. There's too many people get upset and angry in this world. And when that's just not part of your social repertoire, how much can you help other people? Even actually, now I often talk about myself, it's only because that, that I know exactly what happened and why it happened. Remember just one of the most best pieces of praise I ever got in my life was when I received a telephone call from a prison officer. And he said, oh, Ajahn Bam, I got through to you at last. Can you please come back to teach at my prison? The prison where he worked. I said, look, you know, I've got to do meditation retreats, I've got to go to the Buddhist Fellowship, the Buddhist Gem Fellowship, go over to Sydney and Melbourne to teach, and blah, blah, blah. And then he said, look, can you please come to our prison to teach? And of course I said, why me? And what he said was one of the best pieces of praise I've ever heard. He said, because I've been in this prison service all my life, that's my career, I'm about to retire, and I've noticed something strange, unique. Every prisoner who comes to your classes, once they finish their sentence, never come back to prison. Zero recidivism. Uh, and he said, that's why we want you back, please. And sometimes that made me think, why, what, have I, what was I doing? The, you know, people who go to jail, they have a very hard time when they come out of jail. They usually lose their wife, if they're a guy when they're in jail, and their family as well. Who wants to employ someone who was a prisoner before? And so they have a, such a hard time. So anyway, that I said, because I don't ever see any prisoner, in, I don't ever see any criminal in jail. I see the rest of them, the people who weren't criminals. The other part of that person. And I'm going to say this other story which I usually like telling on these retreats. And that was Carl. I hope you don't mind me telling the story of Carl. On one of the retreats here, I think it was an Easter retreat, and then we couldn't find a cook to do the... Was it Easter retreat, Danny? Singapore. Singapore. A Singapore retreat? Yeah. Okay. 
you remember that, yeah? So we couldn't find a cook. So in the last minute, I got this guy, Carl, to do the cooking. And he was absolutely brilliant. To this day, I always remember his pizzas. He'd, he'd make even the, the pastry by hand. He was, worked so hard. And he made really delicious food for everybody. And at the end of the retreat, after nine days, you know, we always do the sharing of merits and thanking you know, the caretakers, thanking you know, the people who organize the retreat, saying thank you to everybody. And they said, can't we say thank you to Carl? Where's he gone? And that's when I made the announcement. It's only made the announcement at the very end of the retreat. And I said, Carl was on work release from Carnet Prison Farm. He was in Carnet for rape. And just like you, everyone went quiet. Ajahn Brahm, you mean you permitted a person serving a sentence for not just one rape, it was a multiple rape, to come and cook for us? Yes. I trusted him. And he served all these Singaporeans this beautiful food. And that shocked them. How, if I'd have said that beforehand, we've got a convicted rapist you know, just coming up for the morning you know, from Carnet Prison Farm up the road to cook for you, how many people would have cancelled? <laughs> well, I did it the other way around. Brought him in first of all. That was one of the great teachings. It says, how do we judge people so quickly? He was a wonderful cook and a wonderful man. You know, he never did any crimes again. He did that crime, those crimes, because of, you know, drugs and just being so young, he was, you know, just not understanding how his actions affect others. But by this time, you know, he was past you know, that type of behavior. And it's a beautiful thing to see what forgiveness is. Give people a chance. You know, he's happily married and you know, working really well. Well done for letting me bring him into the retreat. So, okay, I never finished anyway, never mind. But anyway, the last question, I did promise a ghost story. Lights, please. Ah, oh, come on, <laughs> be brave. <laughs> this is again another true story. It's one of the reasons why we don't have elevators in this retreat center. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> mm. This is a very quick story. This happened in Sirirat Hospital, just on the other side of the river to the, the what do you call it, to the, the Royal Fields in Bangkok. In the main, one of the main hospitals in Bangkok, Sirirat. Early one morning, one of the doctors, he finished his night shift and he was in the elevator, in the lift. Now going downstairs to where this car was parked. And he had a witness, another nurse, was in the lift with him. And they got to a, a floor on the way to the ground floor the, uh, the, where the car park was. And there was a patient waiting to come in to the lift as the doors opened. And the doctor freaked out and he closed the closed door button so quickly. And the nurse said, what on earth did you do that for? There was a patient trying to get in the lift. And the doctor stuttering said, da, 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 da. that was one of my patients who died last night. And my patient, he's dead. It's not a real patient trying to get in, it's a ghost. And in Thailand, at that time, when anybody died, they would always tie this red string around their wrists 
you know, to actually to let people know that you know this is needs to be taken to the morgue. Didn't you see the red string on that patient's wrist? And I said, oh yeah, actually I did. But I've got a red string too. <laughs> <laughs> Does that mean I'm not allowed in the lift? <laughs> no one actually knows how she got out of the lift because at that point the doctor collapsed. <laughs> and they found this you know, unconscious doctor on the floor of the lift and when they got him around, that's what he said. That's the story of how he, he um, fainted. And they checked out, it's totally true. That patient, you know, he said, trying to get in, had died that night before. And that nurse, she died in a road accident on the way to work that morning. She too had a red string around her wrist and wasn't allowed in. So that poor doctor, he had a ghost on the outside trying to get in. <laughs> and when on the inside, he couldn't escape from at all. <laughs> So on your way back into your cottage, <laughs> please check that no one's wearing a red streak. <laughs> Thank you for listening. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Oh my goodness. <laughs> please excuse me. Okay, okay. That's a ghost story, okay. Okay, you can go. <laughs> but be careful. <laughs> oh boy. Okay, those are the ones I did. These ones I haven't done.